Hello, Crossroads. Great to be with you. Um, uh, let me do a little bit of housekeeping here and uh, get you caught up on some immediate things going on. So this Friday night, um, this is being released, by the way, on the 8th. So this Friday is the 11th. Um, and we're having a men's dinner here uh, that night. Uh, we hope you come. Guys, if, you, if you're going to come, again, jump on our website. Click on the uh, graphic that uh, is promoting the men's dinner. And there's a little bit of registration form there to fill out so we know how many guys are coming. Looking forward to being with you this Friday on the 11th for a free dinner, no cost to you. We're just wanting to really gather our men together. And then on the 16th, that's a, a Wednesday night, uh, we begin our summer foundations. And we're really excited about it this year. We're doing it a little different. Rather than dinner before, we're serving dessert after to encourage you to hang around after, fellowship, meet new people, build new relationship, and just be the body of Christ. So the series is through the book of 1 John, which uh, I cannot remember the last time we took the church through that book. So we're pretty excited about it. I'm actually going to launch 1 John this coming Sunday for the whole congregation in hopes of encouraging you to come on those next four Wednesday nights for the whole Foundation series. So uh, if you maybe haven't been to church in a while, come Sunday, we're launching a brand new series, 1 John, and only one week on Sundays. The rest will be Wednesdays at Foundations. And then I'll be getting right back into the book of Acts where we're having so much fun on Sunday morning. So there you have it. Today, uh, we are actually wrapping up the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Um, the Unmoved series from the very beginning has been designed just to encourage faith in your life, my life, as we go through this crazy time we've been in for a while now. Uh, it started with this uh, pandemic upheaval right into the politics of an election year and how crazy all that has been. And uh, so we just felt like we needed to call God's people to uh, a, a faith that would rise up and meet the challenge of the day. Uh, in that process, we felt like we needed to review what biblical faith looks like. Because if you lined up a dozen Christians, you said, what does faith look like in a life? Or what is biblical faith? You could get a lot of different answers. Some believe it's it's having such a hardcore belief that that faith can change the metaphysical world around you. I believe if I believe it enough, say it enough, confess it enough, I'm positive enough about it that I can change reality by my faith. Uh, some believe it's just a passive let go and let God um, affair. So it, it it, there really is a lot of confusion about what faith looks like. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is a great place for us to have gone because it literally just shares story after story after story of what real faith, the kind that pleases God, what it looks like in a believer's life. And we've just been looking at those stories one after the other. Today we finish that chapter. Let me pray. We'll give this thing to the Lord tonight. Let's give him our hearts and our minds that he might cause his word to really advance his work in each of us. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Um, we acknowledge, Lord, it is, is not like anything else. It is the agent you use to transform our life. It is the sword that the Spirit wields to shape and mold, to guide and lead our very life. So, uh, Lord, we hunger for it. We are thirsty for it. We pray, Lord, tonight that it would land on really rich soil in my heart and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let me read the text. Uh, we finished up with um, the very specific cases that the writer of Hebrews drew upon to define biblical faith for us. He was like a laser. He, he highlighted different lives, some prophets, some kings, some judges. And um, 
Uh, some just the patriarchs of old, the, the fathers of the faith, Abraham and Noah. And uh, so he, he gets less specific now, and it's kind of like he, he, he had a, a focus, uh, 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 like a, a long lens um, focused out there on an individual life. And now he opens the lens up and gets a broader picture of common people who lived in extraordinary faith and what they experienced as they lived by faith. So it pick, I want to pick it up actually in verse 33, where after he's mentioned specifically David, Samuel, the prophets, and he just opens that lens up. It's like putting a, a fisheye lens on it now, and a broad picture, he says this in verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. That's one of my favorite phrases in all this passage. Somehow by faith, out of weakness, the faithful ones become strong. I just, I love that became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Man, I love that passage. You might want to underline that in verse 38. Of whom these people of faith, these nameless ones, he's not like looking at specific circumstances or specific people now. He's talking about Men and and women who endured and accomplished extraordinary things by faith, whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, now in this day of redemption, Christ has come died for the sins of man, and purchased his possession. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So there's a lot going on in this passage. Again, so far, um, the writer has been pretty specific with people and their circumstances. Now we're looking at just beyond specifics, the general people of faith and the common things that they accomplished or endured through or by their faith. I want to take that whole text kind of wholesale tonight. I don't want to parse it out and, and kind of like looking at a, a beautiful flower. Sometimes what the teacher needs to do is take it petal by petal. And, and then sometimes you get a text that simply says what it says, and to try to, you'd almost destroy the beauty of it by parsing it out and, and pulling the petals off of it and dismantling it. This is just a wonderful testimony of people's lives who have gone before you and me, who have faced far more than we ever have, and have stood firm in their faith and their love for the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to take it wholesale and unpack four points I want to make. Again, the testimony is that not just the Davids, the Noahs, the Abrahams, the Moseses, the Rahabs, not just these specific giants of the faith, but common ordinary people by and through their faith have experienced extraordinary miracles from the hand of God. So my first truth I want to unpack is simply this. I'm going to give you four of these tonight. The first one, simply this. Through faith, God works miraculously 
in our lives. Through faith, God works miraculously in our lives. That's really what this, these passages, verse 33 through 40, are saying to us in all of these circumstances with generally just common people's lives who live and operate in faith. Through and by that faith, God works miraculously in their lives. It's almost, he's saying almost, expect that. That's who he is, and that's what he does in and through the faith of those who love him. Notice how many times just in this chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews, the words through faith or by faith occur. The words by faith occur 18 times in this one chapter. 18 references to what life is like by faith. How God operates in my life by faith, right? And then two other times, the phrase through faith comes up. So 20 times it refers to God working by and through our trust in Him and our unshakable, unwavering hope that we place in Him. So 20 times it comes up. I wrote this down in my notes. The one who trusts completely in God and places all of their hope in Him will see Him work miraculously. That's my takeaway number one. That's truth number one. Those who put their complete faith in Him and trust Him unwaveringly and put all of their hope in Him, not in anything of this world, not in people, not in stuff, not in the systems of the world, but in, in God Himself, those people, and I believe that's you, and I believe it's me tonight, will see God work miraculously in our lives. By miraculously, I mean we will and should expect to see God intervening in our lives at times to bring forth an unnatural conclusion, an unnatural ending to something, an unnatural consequence. He'll break into what would seem to be normal, and that's what a miracle is. It is God breaking into life, bringing forth the unnatural as He designs it to be. Sometimes He breaks laws of physics. Sometimes a miracle is the breaking a law of medicine or a natural law, a physical law, a law of physics. But those miracular, miracles, and in my life, the miraculous is God intervening at times through or by faith in Him to bring forth an unnatural situation or conclusion to something. Let me show you what I mean from our text. Sometimes in these lists He gives of what they accomplish or endure, sometimes the miracle that they saw God do was something they achieved or accomplished or performed. Let me tell you what I mean. In verse 33, they subdue kingdoms. That's something they achieved by faith. That's a miracle. They, they subdued people groups that were stronger than them. Naturally, that shouldn't have occurred. God's intervention through their hope and trust in Him brought that forth. They worked righteousness, verse 33. They obtained promises, verse 33. These are things, again, they performed or accomplished. They quenched violence of fires, verse 34. They became valiant in battle. They turned away entire armies, verse 34. Their women received their dead raised to life again. I find that fascinating. Now, you read that and you go, okay, wait a minute, time out. But there are two, it's possible that the writer of Hebrews is referring to two very um, specific occurrences of this. Uh, it's possible that it happened way more than that, and it just isn't recorded in Scripture, but at least twice. We're told in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 19, uh, right around through 24, 25, it's the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Uh, her son dies, and Elijah lays himself out over, and, and, and the widow's son is raised from the dead. There's a second occurrence in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, at verse 18. It tells a story of a, 
uh, a Shunammite widow that is caring for Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha, his successor. And her son dies, and God, through Elisha, raises him from the dead. So it's possible that those stories from 1 Kings chapter 17 or 2 Kings chapter 4 are what's being referred to here, or those plus others that just didn't get specifically recorded for us. But women, by faith or through faith, received their dead raised to life, verse 35. But sometimes the miracle that God works through faith, by faith, in as we trust in Him, sometimes the miracle isn't what we, He enables us to achieve or perform that's far greater than what we naturally could. That's a miracle. When, when I become valiant in battle, when really in my heart I'm a coward, or when I am by nature weak but am made strong. See, dear ones, these are miracles that He is saying God works in the lives of people of faith all the time turning away an army when I don't even want to fight. Th- these are amazing things. And, and yet sometimes it's not, the miracle isn't what is performed or achieved, but what one endures steadfastly, loving and hoping in God. Not in what they achieve or perform, but in what they are able to endure. Now you see that in the text too. They escape the edge of the sword and out of weakness are made strong. See, that's not something they achieve. That's something they endured. They're tortured, not accepting deliverance, mockings, scourgings, chains, imprisonments. Verse 36. Verse 37 records that they were stoned. This is terrifying to think of. Sawn in two, slain with the sword. They wandered in sheepskins, destitute, afflicted, and tormented, in verse 37. That's not a miracle that is God's power accomplishing something unnatural and great through a person of faith, but it is God visiting a life and enabling them to faithfully love and serve Him while they endure horrific circumstances. Verse 38, they wander in deserts and mountains, in dens and in the caves of the earth, what they endure. So point number one is simply this, let me say it again, is that through faith or by faith, God works miraculously in your life and mine. When we, can we stop for just a moment tonight and just thank the Lord that He moves in our life to disrupt what would be the natural outcome and bring something unnatural by His good hand in the life of those who live by faith in Him. I find that to be very great news tonight for my life. And when we take a minute and just recognize that He's working these miracles, sometimes we're achieving or performing, obtaining things that are from His hand, And sometimes we're enduring things only by His grace and by His visitation and by His supply in our life. Let me unwrap point number two, our second takeaway from our text. It says this, Sometimes, through faith, the miracle is in His deliverance from something, and other times, the miracle that God performs is His strengthening through something. That's what we kind of just talked about. Sometimes the miracle that God works in our life by or through faith is His deliverance from something terrible. He removes the obstacle. It goes away. He fights the battle. He overcomes. But other times, dear ones, the obstacle isn't removed. It must be faced. And the miracle is him delivering a person through the trial, through the difficulty of it, through the pain of it, through the suffering of it. And sometimes 
it never is allowed to touch our life. He destroys the, the challenge and we're delivered from it. Other times we're delivered through it. Now, both are a miracle. Make no doubt about it. And that miracle is operating through faith, by faith, in Him, but it's a very different miracle. You saw it in our text. Sometimes the army was defeated. They, they without even shooting an arrow, would defeat an adversary. Uh, and, and an army would flee. Other times, they would endure, endure horrifying situations, and the Lord, His miracle would be that they endure it in faith and continue to love and trust Him. Maybe as you look back in your life, I know as I do mine, I've seen the Lord do both. Sometimes He delivers me from something, <laughs> and other times He says, no, I'm going to deliver you through something. Both are miraculous. Both are God's hand working on our behalf in our life for His glory and for our highest good. So I want to leave that point there, and I'm going to kind of expand on that a little bit with point number three. So that truth, number two, said sometimes through faith, the miracle of God is in delivering us from something. Sometimes that miracle is delivering us through something. Now, point number three the determining factor of whether or not we are delivered from or delivered through is not our faith. The determining factor is the sovereign, perfect will of God, wisdom of God, and purpose of God. I need to say that again. That's a mouthful. I really want you to get this. I just told you that from this text we learn that sometimes the miracle is God delivering us from, sometimes the miracle is delivering us through. This truth says the determining factor of whether God's miracle is we are delivered by that miracle from or through, the determining factor is not your faith, the quality of it, the depth of it, the weight of it, the strength of it. It's the determining factor of whether we're delivered from or through is the divine, sovereign, perfect will of God, wisdom of God, and purpose of God, which is to glorify His Son. So how that miracle operates really is not determined. Don't let people tell you, well, if you had more faith, you'd have been delivered from that thing and not gone through it. That's just a lie. What that miracle looks like, delivered from or through, is entirely up to the sovereignty of God and God's perfect plan and will for your life and for the glory of His Son. Our text bears this out. A couple examples here. In verse 34, okay, we are told there that by faith they escape the sword, so they're delivered from, right? But in verse 37 we're told that by faith they were put to death by the sword. They endured through it. They were delivered through it, meaning their faith was intact. They faced death by sword and continued to love God and be faithful to Him. Why? We're not, we're not given any explanation other than God in His sovereignty, in His high and perfect will and purpose, in one circumstance, delivers from, and in another, delivers through. The determining factor is not your faith. The determining factor is the plans and purposes of God. In the Bible, there's a number of these examples, but here's another one in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. There uh, declares that James, by the hand of Herod, is put to death by the sword. He's killed. Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 record that Herod put James to death by sword. All right? In the immediate following verses, Peter is arrested by the same regime. He's arrested, but an angel of the Lord is sent to deliver him out of prison, and he escapes death by the sword. Why? One, it's never recorded that 
well, James just didn't have the, have the faith of Peter. That's ridiculous. It never says that. You can't ever make that case. It is determined by the sovereign plans and purposes of God that, that dear ones, we clearly don't get to see. I don't see tomorrow. I don't see the end from the beginning. I don't know the secret purposes of God. Neither do you. I do know that the determining factor, whether we receive a miracle through or by our faith of God delivering us from or through something, won't be my faith or yours. It will be his purpose and plans and will. Paul clearly understood that the Lord would always deliver him. In other words, it's not a question whether we will be miraculously visited by the Lord and delivered probably many times through our life. Through our faith, by faith, God will move miraculously in our life to our deliverance. Um, He just never knew whether that deliverance (laughs) would be from something or through something, did he? Listen to Philippians chapter 1. Verse 18, turn there in your Bibles. This is a really important passage. Turn there now and let me read it for us. Philippians 1, 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and Paul says, and in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. He wrote this from prison. He was facing a judgment that could end in his death in his execution, and he says, I know that this will end in my deliverance. There is no question whether my life in this circumstance, sitting in this prison right now, will end in deliverance. I just don't know whether he will deliver me from it or through it. I don't know that at this point, but I know God will miraculously move in my life as a person of faith. I just find that so exciting right now in my life. He knew that, that God would bring a miracle of deliverance. He just didn't know what that would look like. He goes on, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh man, did you get that? There was never a minute where Paul struggled to believe that a miracle was coming. God would meet him in his desperation. Faith by and through that simple trust and hope in God. The problem was he didn't know whether it resulted in him visiting his life and strengthening him through the suffering of death, or whether the Lord would deliver him from death at this time in his life. Turns out the Lord delivers him from death at this point in time, only to die another day for the sake of the gospel, where he would perform another miracle. He would deliver him through that moment, that crisis in his life. God would be found faithful to him. Isn't that wonderful? Dear one, tonight, right now, or right today, through the challenges that we face, I know the Lord will deliver you. I know the Lord will deliver me through or by faith. I just don't know what that deliverance will look like, but I know I can trust him. Would you trust him in a fresh way tonight, right now? In Philippians, verse 217, to the same point, Paul writes, I love this verse. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoicing with y'all. Did you hear what he said? He said, and if in my service to the kingdom, and if I end up being poured out like a drink, meaning die, if I die, my life blood is poured out as an offering to God, then that's okay. He said that because he didn't hold his own life dear, by the way, we're told in that same book of Philippians. But But he said, if my life is poured out, then it doesn't matter. I'm trusting God for everything. This is what faith does. That's back to my first point, isn't it? That in the life of the people who put their trust in him, God will work miraculously. We will see him working like that. Let me wrap up with this fourth 
point, let's unpack it. It says simply this, the world that we live in, this temporal broken world that we live in right now is not worthy of those who love God himself over what this life can offer or what death could ever take away. I want to read that again. The world that we live in is not worthy. This is what he's saying there at the end of this passage, verse, what, 39, 40 there. He says, the world isn't worthy of those who love God himself more than what this life could ever offer or what death could ever take away from us. We love him supremely over everything in this life or all that it could offer or what we fear that even death could steal from us. We love him more. And our faith is in allegiance to him through through everything. That person, he's saying, who loves God supremely that way is a gift to this world. We're a gift to this world. And the world isn't worthy of those who believe every day that God is my deliverer and he will deliver me either from or through, but I know that by faith as I trust in him, I will see his mighty hand working miraculously over and over and over again in my life. The world is not worthy of such men and women who love and trust God supremely that way. They love him himself more than whatever this life could possibly offer or what death could ever steal away from us. Our allegiance is always and will always be to him. Isn't that great? You're a gift to the world. Let me encourage you tonight as I close in prayer to, I suppose, just receive that thought, that truth. That's what he said, that the world isn't worthy of such people. I suppose the reason for that is because the world in all of its unbelief and hatred towards God, its creator, that that world sees in that person that will endure all things and stand and live in steadfast, unmovable faith in God. They see in them a testimony of eternal life. And, and the world isn't deserving of that revelation of how to receive eternal life and what eternal life looks like in faith in Christ. But, but even to an undeserving world, even to an undeserving man like me, the Lord has revealed his redemptive love, his grace available through Christ. And, and a world who shakes it fist, its fist at him every day isn't worthy of the testimony that is born into the world through faithful people, faithful Christians who love God supremely and will face anything in faith and by faith because they love him more than life and more than anything they think death could ever take away from them. That's you. And I pray that you stand in that faith today, tomorrow, the rest of your life, every day of it. And I pray that tonight we just rejoice that we're gifts to the world around us as we bear testimony, a testimony of faith in the world. Praise the Lord. Let me pray. You close with me. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. What a great chapter of Scripture. And I just pray, Lord, that by it, we would be strengthened and encouraged in our faith. It gives us a whole different understanding of what faith looks like in a real Christian, in a real child of God. Lord, may you make each of us men and women of faith. That's our prayer. And that it would be a faith that ultimately pleases the heart of God. Oh, we love you, Lord. May you go before each of us now, and may you follow us with goodness and mercy all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless your family, and now until next time, uh, go in his love. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.